Welcome to Costumes of Fantasy and Futurism, presented by the Costume Designers Guild, in partnership with Joanne Fabrics and Craft Stores, with platinum-level support from ABC Studios Costumes. Be sure to have your questions ready, and we look forward to hearing from you. While we're waiting, if you're watching on a larger screen, please go to the settings at the bottom of your Vimeo player and choose either 1080p or 720p so that you have the best possible viewing experience. And now, the costumes of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Goddess of death. How did this happen? Man, he's a he's a fighter. Official shield activity. Some of us could be killed. Welcome back. We hired them and they steal from us. He's my father. If they're shooting at you, they're bad. This can't seem to miss. introduction for the fantastic panel that we have coming up about the costumes of the Marvel Cinematic Universe presented by the Costume Designers Guild and in partnership with Joanne Craft and Fab Fabric and Craft Stores as well as platinum level sponsor ABC Studios Costumes. I'm Zoe Hewitt. I'm a freelance reporter for Variety and other outlets and I'm absolutely thrilled to be here with you today. And before we get started, it makes the most sense for all of us to for me to introduce everyone so you can connect names and faces with that multi-billion dollar franchise worth of clips that you just saw. So going in the same order as the reel that you just watched, costume designer Ruth Carter earned an Academy Award for the costumes for the hit film Black Panther. 
Although we will be focusing on Marvel during the panel, I would be remiss not to mention her other Oscar-nominated work on Steven Spielberg's Amistad and Spike Lee's Malcolm X. And of course, I can't leave out her upcoming project with some great expectations, and that's coming to America too. For having us. Happy to be here. <laughs> Costume designer Maya S. Rubio was an Oscar nominee this past year for her work on the costumes for Jojo Rabbit. Within the Marvel Universe, I feel confident calling her a Thor expert, considering her credits include Thor Ragnarok, the shorts Team Thor and Team Thor 2, the upcoming Thor Love and Thunder that's in pre-production, and she also worked on the Marvel miniseries WandaVision that is in post-production now. Welcome, Maya <laughs> Costume concept artist Philip Boutet Jr. has worked with a multitude of costume designers helping flesh out the costume designs on Marvel projects, including Black Panther, Captain Marvel, Avengers Endgame, Avengers Infinity War, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, and Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., to name just a few of them. Once movie releases are back on track, we'll see his work up next, also in Jungle Cruise, starring The Rock. <laughs> Welcome, Philip. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Costume designer Judiana Makovsky is a three-time Oscar nominee and another expert in the Marvel Universe, having worked on films including Avengers Endgame, Avengers Infinity War, Captain America Civil War, Captain America the Winter Soldier, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, and the upcoming Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. And of course, I would be remiss if I didn't mention two other franchises with which she kicked off her designs, and that would be the Harry Potter franchise and Hunger Games, working on the first movies of both. Welcome, Judiana. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> now, this would typically be the part in a panel where we pause because the audience would be clapping so much for all of you in that impressive clip reel. But since we're here in isolation, it's probably a good time to transition to Avengers Endgame. And Judiana, you had a big scene in that movie where even the actors didn't quite know what was happening. And that was one that fans were anticipating, the big funeral scene. So how did you design costumes for characters, some of whom weren't even normally on Earth, and explain to them why they were dressed a certain way without giving away the secrets. Well, it, it was really fascinating that most of the actors had no idea what we were filming. They were not given a script. They were not given the story. And we had several fittings where I had to fly to many places and just sort of reassure them that they were going to be wearing one of the choices that I had, and it was black, or uh, as for the Guardians of the Galaxy, they had no idea they were going to end up on Earth. So I had to design clothes that would look like the Guardians, but still fit on Earth without being noticed too much and in a sea of black. So, <laughs> you know, they were very trusting. The actors are amazing to work for. I have to say, shooting that scene was probably one of the most amazing days of my life. I've never seen that many sort of A-list actors all in the same place. We had the largest base camp I have ever seen. I've kept my little map of where all the trailers were, all the hair and makeup trailers. We called it Base City. And it was everyone when they walked on the set to just see all those actors all in the same place at the same time. And for a very moving scene that literally most of them found out what the scene was that morning. <laughs> they didn't know. I'm sure they had their suspicions, but they actually didn't know who the funeral was for. <laughs> well, that's well, that's we called it the wedding. <laughs> it was always the wedding on the call sheets and travel mo movements. So they really had no clue. And that's a big secret. And one of the things we talked about earlier, Judiana, that I loved was I imagined when you went for fittings that you like tucked costumes into your checked luggage. So like something disappears on the carousel and someone's very excited about no, no, what they no. get. Well, we, don't, we don't put them in the cargo hold on airplanes. <laughs> Everything has to be well planned out beforehand and shipped ahead and people there to meet it and spaces set up to fit these actors. So it, it's all a very coordinated, you know, effort to get these things on camera, especially when you're dealing like something with Infinity War and Endgame with, you know, every actor that's ever been in the Marvel universe. Mm -hmm. It was, um, thank God I had a brilliant crew. <laughs> well, speaking of brilliant crew, Phil, you worked on the movie and actually you also had no idea what the big scene was, did you? No, and Judiana kept it completely a secret. It was, um, 
the fun part for me is I'm a fan. So oftentimes some parts of the movies just get ruined because you see everything as it's developing. Um, but Juliana was really good at making sure to keep that a secret to a point where I started to kind of figure out, I was like, we had, it was a funeral. And then I think on my illustrations, we labeled it as a celebration just to make sure that it was a throw off. Right. So I'm drawing all these people and I'm figuring out it's a funeral. So I started playing a game with Juliana where I'd be like, so, um, I haven't drawn T'Challa yet. Uh, and it's like, is he dead? And then she's like, you're gonna draw him right now. So she kept, she kept every person I would guess. And then after a while I stopped because I really didn't want to be surprised. So I saw it with everybody in the audience, just like everything else. I got off social media for like a complete month. And then when the movie hit, it was just such a great surprise and such a good feeling to see it just like everyone else, but she was yeah. very tight lipped <laughs> the whole time. I say, Marvel says I'm very good. I'm like Fortnite. <laughs> I, I never say anything. I, I just refuse to reveal. It gives it away. It makes it less fun if people know what's gonna come up. The mm -hmm. surprise, I mean, I to this day I don't know how we kept Fat Thor a secret. <laughs> it never got out. And we had fittings and you know, we had hair and makeup tests, but it never got out. And speaking of fat Thor, um, Maya, you actually had a very different Thor that you had to design for than the one that Juliana had in Endgame. So how did the textures and the materials that you used for the costumes really support the different uh, worlds of Thor Ragnarok then? Well, there were, uh, there were different uh, stars because the, when we started the movie, Thor was in a in a, you know, kind of like a voluntary exile from Asgard. So his clothes uh, had to look like somebody that he's been, you know, uh, in the company of Sherpas or something that of that uh, similarity. Um, what we did, we did a different kind of a Thor, uh, much more organic of what, uh, Judiana and uh, and um, you know uh, the first costume designer helped me, Alex. Alex uh, burned it. Uh, they did a fantastic, incredible, you know, very intricate uh, design. And for this one, we have to like pull back a lot. I mean, to the point in where all all his cuirasses were made in house by a leather master instead of a specialty or cutting room. So it was it was quite different. It was quite different. It was uh, uh, a lot simpler, I think, in terms of um, everything. Yeah. And uh, without taking away anything of my colleagues that did so, so beautifully, and they, you know, from them, I got my, my, my lead point, my point of departure was because they have, you know, um, they have trailblazed it for me the path on how to get to this door. So, and this is what we do in the MCU. We, uh, we it, our movies interwing like that. So sometimes I would take uh, designs that, uh, that I inherit from Judiana or Alex or Sonia or maybe Ruthie, and they will do the same. I remember you said, oh my, yes, don't make it complicated because I have to do something from your costume. Uh, 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 and then the same thing happened. You know, it's like a the good thing about all costume designers in uh, at Marvel. We all know each other. Mm -hmm. uh, we're friends. We're like, first of all, incredible colleagues. I feel so lucky to be amongst these wonderful ladies and uh, and gentlemen. Also. <laughs> uh, so. Uh, yeah, it was it was quite different. It was quite different, my Thor, and also the Thor that we that what that took the middle of the movie was a gladiator Thor that he had to be affected by the surrounding of a uh, of, of of the city that he was because he was kept hostage and uh, a prisoner uh, to become a gladiator, and that's why. You know, many of the pieces he has, it wasn't his choice. Like the helmet, it wasn't his choice, but it, you know, it worked out. The materials are completely different of what he wore, which was like a leather, leather cuirasses. So 
we combined that specialty sort of looking uh, helmet and also the pieces th that he wore in his in his shoulder is a piece from uh, maybe uh, you know an artifact from Sakar. In fact, you know that's why the color is so bright and so different, and then the the painting and it was a little bit more graffiti kind of like city underground kind of stuff. And um, for me, it was a oh my god, incredible fun to work on that movie and to also to land it in preparation in the same place that Juliana was. Uh, she was doing Avengers, and she, you know, she she took me on her, on her under her wing because at the beginning, you know, it's kind of um, intimidating to start working for a big Marvel movie uh, for the first time. There are many things you have to help somebody that uh, navigates you through the space and the rules and the and the world. And that was Juliana for me. So I thank her. <laughs> and, you know, speaking of coming into a franchise and navigating a new world, Ruth, you actually had to do that also with the fictional Wakanda, which you've also said, like, a lot of people wanted to connect it to, like, Lion King or coming to America. Like, they had these visions, right, of what it should be and what Africa was. But your Wakanda was very different. So what did you want the costumes to say about it? Oh, yes, I was a newbie. And um, uh, what gave me confidence at the start is I had lunch with Juliana and she said, I think you know the materials that's going to be required for this. And so in my head, it was all about the materials and being as authentic as I could. So I'm going to first thank Juliana for her endorsement there. It did give me a nice big push in the right direction. Well, and look what you did. You didn't have to the My God. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, I say that uh, about the Lion King and coming to America as a joke, and it, it just really does speak to the fact that we hadn't ever had a truly um, authentic version of um, Africa and, and never before had Africa been placed in a superhero model like, you know, this opportunity was. So I definitely wanted to shift uh, the paradigm to something that I felt I was connected to, that culture was connected to, but maybe um, we needed to see it. We really needed to see it. And then we wouldn't associate sometimes a comedy with real life uh, as in coming to America, which, you know, they they did a beautiful job on that film and there's nothing wrong with connect. It was our first actual connection to culture in a big movie. Um, but uh, that was for that uh, genre. And so the same with The Lion King, gorgeous, gorgeous costumes. I mean, uh, a great opportunity to put that, you know, on stage. But this needed to be unique to its Itself. And um, we were very um, clear that uh, everything had to stem from an authentic place. So we did a lot of research and we used, you know, some of the same um, practices that that Myas and Judiana use when they build their superhero films, like, you know, carving uh, carvings uh, for armor and things like that. But the aesthetic and the, the look of it had to go into the direction of of tribes and of Africa. So that's how I was like shouting to my crew, this is not the Lion King, people! <laughs> and uh, they got it, they got it. Um, you know, and one of the things I love is that you get, you used about eight different tribes worth of design elements, but they're all used properly, which is also something that we haven't seen before. Like the beadwork that we see in the movie is yeah. properly done. Well, yeah, the idea of mixing uh, different tribes and different cultures is very sensitive. It's sensitive to the people that uh, are of those uh, of those communities and uh, and groups. And so there are a lot of things that are shared. Um, they're shared in other cultures. They're shared within Africa. So it, we had to be careful about you know how we mix the messages. And uh, so beadwork was something that could go across the 
boundaries. But when you see the Lesotho blankets, we didn't want to over overly play them, the blankets that the border tribe wears, is specifically to that group. And then you don't see many other kinds of tribal uh, representations with that group because the, the blanket is so significant to um, South Africa. And, you know, speaking of the beading as well, you let me in on a little secret that uh, for stunts, you can't use things like beads because they will really hurt if you're in a fight with someone and you get yeah. whacked in the head. Right. So what were some of the other costume adaptations you had to make for stunts? Well, you know, the whole costume itself. I mean, there's armor. We did a prototype. You know, we had a jewelry designer come in and and you know, bend the armor and do the, the neck rings and the necklaces and things. And we had a prototype of metal. So you can't really do much with that if you're going to be moving in a battle scene. So the, everything, once the prototype was made, had to be uh, molded and, and pulled out of rubber. And speaking of stunts, like we as an audience might sometimes think costumes are sort of like neck to ankle and forget completely about shoes. But Judiana, you have to have about four pairs of shoes for every single costume you design. Isn't that right? Well, normally we do. We For, for women particularly, men not not particularly, but we do alter stuntmen's shoes. But for women, you know, we if they're wearing a higher heel, we end up usually making a flat pair for a stunt person, maybe a three quarter for a stunt person, our leading lady like Scarlett. Um, when I first started, I think on Winter Soldier, we had four heights of heels, depending on what action she was taking. Um, by the time we finished, Scarlett had had enough of the high, high heels, and we only had two heights of heels, very small. But then you make a special pair for stunts that are flat. Or for the men, you know, we like to incorporate a sneaker bottom for the stunt men. So the shoe bill is very high. I will tell you <laughs> a shoe budget is one, something you really have to consider in these movies <laughs> and people don't even notice if, you know, it moves so fast that you can't tell the shoes are slightly different. And since the, some, and since the stuntmen and everyone has to appear about the same height as the regular actors, sometimes you said you also have to put lifts in the men's shoes too, right? I, I have done that, yes. On, if the stuntmen are not the same height as the other stuntmen, I mean, on film, they all, all the actors have to have the same relation to each other. So if one stuntman is too short, you have to, uh, you know, accommodate. <laughs> and we do that for actors, too. <laughs> you know, lifts are a, a thing <laughs> for multiple actors. But it's also about getting them all in the frame. You know, having you have a lot of massive men <laughs> and, and you have a lot of short women. So that's one reason we end up putting the girls in high heels at times or a high wedge so that they'll fit in the frame. Because I have to say, you know, a lot of the women that I've worked with in these movies are five, four, you know, and the men are six, four. So, <laughs> you know, it's it's making a pretty picture. And Phil, also for you, for Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. in particular, right, you've had to do some work with the for stunts and just the adaptation there, too. Yeah, usually when we're kind of even going through and kind of starting to think about the, the conceptual side of illustrating these costumes, a lot of it plays into function, right? So you're thinking about the fact that they have to do all this action. So if you have a character and you're just starting them, it's good to think about those things beforehand, knowing that they're going to need pads, there's going to be hidden harnesses and all of that. Um, and so sometimes even we'll incorporate style lines into the costume to where we know that we can then hide the harness or it'll be easier to do it. Um, but we're often thinking about that. And then from just listening to different um, costume designers and kind of figuring out those functions, I've been able to say like, okay, there might need to be a little thing or a gusset here or something there, or, you know, you're trying to think about it all at the same time. And I think sometimes that's difficult because you're also thinking, how can this design look as cool as possible, but then also how can it be functional? And it's a really, you know, delicate balance to ride that, you know, to ride that line and to be able to have them do all the stuff that they need to do. Um, I don't envy their job at all. It's really hard. <laughs> Very difficult. I really like that you're thinking about it, Phil. <laughs> 
can do. <laughs> and, you know, as all these costumes are made in different ways, one of the things that I always imagine is sort of like sitting with a sewing needle and thread or maybe at a sewing machine, but with the, the advent of technology, you guys also have a lot more tools to create things, like through 3D printing. And Ruth, I know um, on Black Panther, right, the Ishikolo and the uh, Queen's Mantle also yeah, were yeah. 3D printed, weren't they? So how do you decide sort of which technology you're going to lean on to create your designs? Oh, you know, uh, Wakanda is, you know, leading in technology. And so when you're thinking about the queen, you're like, she cannot be regular, you know? <laughs> She's got to have, like, the the most, uh, you know, highest technologically built costume we could think of. And then Phil said, I know, there's a girl at UCLA that does 3D printing. And that was Julia Corner. And we brought her in and we talked to her. We came up with a shape and she went off and did the algorithms and sent us um, all different types of versions. Uh, we based the, sh the shoulder mantle on um, African lace and the Ishikolo also had the lines of a truly woven um, married woman's hat from South Africa. And we thought, you know, this sphere has to be perfect. You know, there there could be some legend to the, the shape, you know, a story deep in the Wakandan universe about her crown and how it was conceived. And so all that backstory just, you know, really lent itself to let's really do something special for her that sets it apart. Part. And, you know, I mean, it's amazing how that technology can evolve and help you build costumes. And then, of course, once <laughs> actors put them on, it's like sometimes they're a completely different person. Not sometimes, they are completely different. And, Judiana, you had an experience like that, didn't you, with Winter Soldier, where you actually had to do some reshoots because once the actor put on his costume, it was totally different. <laughs> well, no, it was actually, Sebastian Stan was amazing. I mean, we did these fittings and created the Winter Soldier. And it was actually, it was so successful of trying to get this odd character be a superhero, but be more real clothes. And that's part of working with the Russo brothers is always, you know, sort of anti-costumes. They're not, they, they, I have to pull back so they look more real. They're not big glamour costumes. But the Winter Soldier, the minute he got to the set and had the hair and makeup and we had the arm on and he was the first time like really all together, he suddenly was about to roll and walk to the set and had this swagger that nobody had seen. No one had seen it. And we had, everybody went, whoa, where did that come from? Well, they had already shot some scenes with the stunt person who did not have that. Oh, wow. He didn't walk like that, didn't move yeah. like that. Wow. And so we had to go back and reshoot the stuntman and had, he had to work with Sebastian. But Sebastian gave no clue that he was working all this up because in the fitting, he is a perfect actor for a fitting. He just stands there and lets us do his, our job. He doesn't fidget. He just lets us do our job. So it was amazing. That first day of shooting was incredible. Wow. Yeah. So it, it, an actor can transform once they get these things on. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, clearly. And speaking of fittings, like to me, I imagine like you go into a dressing room, right? And then you put something on, you come out and that's it. But like, Maya, so you actually had what a 10 hour fitting with Tom Hiddleston for, one of, for the movie. So like, what do you do for 10 hours? Um, I, you know, I panicked <laughs> because the, uh, this setup was I flew from Australia to try uh, the first pass of uh, Tom Hiddleston Loki's costume, and um, it was uh, it was the one that he was gonna wear in the car. I think you had another image of it when he was sitting down, different costume. Uh, but the you know the he came. Uh, if you know Tom, Tom is a very uh, very committed actor and he when he's when he gets the the part he just goes and uh you you can't you can't uh rush it so we were in this hotel suite in new york city uh for you know we finished at one o'clock i think we had lunch and pizza <laughs> at the end because he came with his computer his laptop 
with the whole uh, desktop was full of ideas, files, and we went one by one, and he said this and that, and and why, and this, and this color, he said, this was the costume we did. And uh, so I came back, the, the costume that we did prior to this did not work, we just like, okay, bye, and we start. Yeah, and this look, you know, I mean, he helped me a lot because he he explained what what it meant for him and what you know his um, how this costume was gonna help him uh, go through this new phase of Loki, you know, that is uh, when he arrives to Sakar and trying not to know his brother, not to know his father, and he's been uh, you know siding with the wrong people. And that 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 made it uh, happen. I mean, it really helped me. It really helped me that he he uh, we had all that conversation, and we became very good friends. You know, and uh, I love him to bits. I mean, he's wonderful. But it was that that ten hours was like. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was like a little bit. I mean, uh, next day I had to take the flight coming back to Australia. <laughs> I think I, you know, I was, uh, I was asleep the whole flight. And, <laughs> yeah, that was fantastic. I mean, um, fittings are amazing. Fittings is the only portal we have in where we combine all our efforts and designs that we do, you know, with our team, with the marble team ourselves. Oh, new innovation. Sometimes things just happen on the on the fitting like that. I mean, like choosing something that it has not been planned for. And it, it, it becomes like a big thing, you know? And um, so it, it's a, that's why when they told you only have one hour fitting, and I say, no, that's not gonna work. This, this is like, we just start breaking the ice after the hour, if you don't know the actor. Then we start the conversation and we try to, so many things and we have to leave the actors alone a little bit to let them to let them find to see that new person in the mirror and say, oh, I see now that's my character, or it's not, you know. Let me try something else. So that is why it's so important for us. Three things is our time. This is when we create with the actor, and this is the uh, we find out good things and things to fix or things to uh, innovate or renovate. So I'm sure my colleagues agree with me. And that's oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I know that um, I still have some more questions for you. I could go on for hours. All of you are so fascinating with your stories, but I also know our audience must as well. So if you are in the chat, um, you'll see a chat that comes up on the right part of your screen. So if you're on your computer, if you're on an Android device, you can feel free to ask some questions in the chat and they will be sent to me. And at the end, just like at a Comic-Con, we will have a Q&A so that I can answer, get the answers to some of your questions for you as well. But also like Maya was talking about going into fittings and having so many Many people also with an opinion. Ruth, was there a time on Black Panther where you had to really not fight, maybe that's sort of too strong of a term, but really fight for what you wanted in a certain costume and explain to people, I really think this is the way to go, just because mm -hmm. there are so many opinions. Yes, um, you know, um, actually, all of us on Black Panther were so supportive of the, of each other, and we did so much planning. And uh, so to see these costumes come to life, you know, it was thrilling, and everyone was excited about wearing these costumes. But I do remember uh, Shuri's orange vest was so bright orange. I mean, it was uh, bordering on neon, and uh, they were hiding as they traveled through Jabari, Land, and I remember Rachel Morrison coming to me and she's like, now how is she going to hide in that neon orange vest? And we uh, made it in several versions of orange. We tried, you know, pumpkin. We tried to mute it down and it was that orange that just was the right choice for her. And she, um, uh, the actress uh, uh, kept saying to me, you know, Ruth, you must fight. You must fight for it. And I was like, OK, I'm going to fight. <laughs> and uh, we tested it and it actually was pretty cool. So it ended up staying in the in the movie. But, 
you know, there, you know, fortunately on Black Panther, we all felt a real responsibility and we felt like we were doing something good and people were supportive of each other. So if there was a, a conversation about something that didn't work, I mean, with Lupita, most of the fittings that worked with her happened in her trailer. When she came to my fitting room, for some reason, it was the huge jinx of the day. And like we were throwing things out more than we were keeping things. But we learned so much that we could get back into the workroom and retool. And then her next fitting was at 4 a.m. in her trailer and voila. So we all talk through it. It's a hugely collaborative uh, medium. And, you know, the more the, the more conversations you have with people, the more collaborating you do, the more listening you do, um, the better the results because you're actually um, immersing yourself in the whole composition of the film and not just your part. And uh, I know we've got some clips of Black Panther that we can play uh, in the background. So then I've got another question for you, Ruth. I know that, sure. you know, as much planning as you can put into things, so we've got the clip playing, or which will be coming up, um, you know, as much planning as you can put in, sometimes just due to outside sources, sometimes just, you know, shipping company doesn't ship on time, We wind, you wind up sort of down to the wire with things. So what costume was there, like, or was there ever a moment where it was like you're praying to the Marvel gods that something was going to get done on time? Well, that was the shoulder mantle for uh, Queen Ramonda because it was 3D printed in Belgium and it had to go through customs and we got it pretty late, we had to assemble it. But everything else we made right there, uh, especially for this scene, most of these things were gathered and made right in house in Atlanta. So there was a long, arduous process of, you know, getting people into their traditional costumes for each tribe. And the color palette was very specific for everyone. Um, T'Challa's fighting in water, so there oh, there had to be several of his um, fighting costumes made, um, as well as the Dora Milaje. The Dora Milaje, for the most part, uh, was made out of uh, leather pieces, and, and even the rubber pieces had, you know, uh, leather uh, mixed in. So we couldn't use them at the Warrior Falls. We had to come up with something that would be considered their, you know, fight. Um, suit in the water, and uh, they actually had a scene that it wasn't, it didn't make it in the movie where they're all in the water um, in opposition to the Jabari tribe, you know, and they go into a splish splash, you know, battle. But uh, so we had to come up with something that was in keeping with their um, look as well as a, a, a companion to T'Challa and was water, you know, water friendly. And so that's what we had. That seems like a high order for sure. <laughs> yeah, a lot of work. <laughs> and Judiana, what about you? Was there a time that you were just down to the wire praying to those Marvel gods for help? <laughs> Oh, I think every costume. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's also, I mean, particularly on, you know, the Avengers, the last two Avengers, they were so large. I mean, there were so many actors. The actors, you know, we didn't have a lot of fitting time with these actors, so they would come in, you know, a day or two before often for final fittings or even a first fitting. I mean, when we did the... the um, the funeral sequence, the guardians, they all, I just made those clothes and they came in the night before and we fit them. You know, it's so, I would say almost every costume, I am praying that in the morning it's ready and will work <laughs> and wearable. <laughs> yeah. Maez, what about you? I know everyone is always interested in like those down to the wire minutes and how you overcame. So what costume did it for you? Um. I guess it was the Grandmaster's uh, guards. Uh, it's the, um, originally we had made this costume. Uh, it was based on Kirby, Jack Kirby, the great, you know, uh, 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 artist mm -hmm. and uh, editor and everything of Marvel. 
he uh, he created all those shapes that they were very very postmodern when he did it, and that worked for us. And it was just a matter to incorporate the colors that he used and take them into another level. Um, when I when I once we were approved uh, with the designs, what I think we have it here. This one was sketched by Christian Cordela, and the. Um, then it was like uh, the cost of to make this, uh, we needed to make about 50 of them and all, they're all different. They're all absolutely different. And the, uh, the cost was prohibited. So I, I went to China. I mean, I didn't go to China, but I called my, my, my contacts in China and they came back with very bright colors. And uh, I showed to Taika and Brad Winderbaum, my uh, my producer, and they were like, uh, oh, "We have to embrace them. We have to do something about it. We still have to paint on top of them because it was just much too bright. And really, uh, it didn't look uh, something that I was made as a specialty house. If you see my uh, guards, like half of them, for instance, even even topaz." Um, you see another kind of finishing, that's because I made it in Weta. And the the ones that I made in China were wonderful, but we didn't have those sculpted pieces. So, because it could just cost a lot more money. So we made them with, with soft materials and they made an incredible job in China for me. I mean, they really came through. And uh, exactly the colors, exactly what we needed. And then, of course, you always retouch everything with the patinas and the uh, paint over. And the, if you have a good head textile artist, I happen to have Matt Breitschman, who is an authority, and he had a, a lead key, uh, you know, textile artist. His name is Amy. Amy Wright, and it was was wonderful. It came through, but I was I was really a little shaken up because are they gonna work? They're not gonna work. How long are we gonna use them? Usually, we were gonna uh, that scene was supposed to last maybe a week or two, and I think we used them for two months. And they were falling apart because of they weren't tear. And then uh, we have a crew just like gluing things back together and painting them back together. You always have that especially if you have water involved or, you know, fighting involved. It's, uh, it's, always, it's always that. Well, we have some audience questions. And starting off with you, Phil, that sort of ties in with what Maya was talking about. Can you explain then, since uh, you have worked with the designers on this panel mostly, uh, can you explain how uh, your work as an illustrator actually complements the designer's work and how many drafts you typically go through for a costume? Oh, that's a doozy. Um, <laughs> there's so many drafts and so many variations um, and versions. Um, ultimately, my work is there to support and also to help sell, right? So it's like I'm usually on a project for the first like few months, and then there's a whole another process that happens after that. So it's like a down the line process. Um, so when looking at even the right now, what's on screen is one of the Aisha handmaidens um, with Juliana. Um, we did so many versions of those and there was all these different shapes and we're just like, I know my initial brief, I can tell you just in terms of how to start working with the designer is Juliana would come in and she said, she said, we've got these gold people. They're aesthetically perfect and beautiful. Um, I think I want them to look like columns. So they were, you know, straight up and down, like very tall. And she just had this like in her head that they were gold and columns. Um, she brought up Klimt as a reference, an art reference. Um, and then just for herself personally, she's like, I like headdresses from like the twenties, like shapes from the twenties. So I had all that kind of research and reference. And then you just start to kind of start to just do versions and versions. You can see this one, there's a little shirt, a short, short kind of jacket. We just did all these different versions that build in the line of that parameter. Um, and then you sell them, you go and she, you know, she goes to the meetings and she sells them and tries to figure out what, what's working best. Um, also even just looking at the different variations, I think halfway through, we started to add, she said, uh, we need a Royal color. So she added blue. And I think that that ended up carrying through, through a lot of the costumes. Um, and so it's, it's that process. Also, I think that was a good one to show just because process wise for me, I'm always trying to learn. So there's all these different things to learn. And the best part about that particular costume or that process 
was I was right next door. My office was right next door to where the specialty costume makers are. So I was getting to see all the stuff that they were physically making, like just random gold. Like they were going to auto park stores and all these different places to just try and find gold pieces. But that helped to inform me of how the functionality of the costume that they were trying to make was going to work. And also I could draw things into my drawing of things we functionally had, which I think was really helpful. Um, um, so it was kind of like that process and going back and forth. And I think that's, that's just a general gist of how we work. Um, often I think Juliana's process is the most fun sometimes to watch in terms of she gets up in the morning, she has her coffee, she answers emails, she comes in and talks to me, then she goes here then she goes there. And I mean, costume designers, that's just their normal process, right? They're like our art directors. So they're going through their entire department. So there's so many different people, um, but watching that process and watching how they all work. Um, also help to kind of in, inform like how that process, like how that, like, it's, how a, it's a true design process. And there's so many variations. And so, Chidiana, Chidiana actually mentioned you. Know, oh, it sounds like we've got a bit of an echo at the moment. So, Chidiana, Phil actually mentioned you like go taking some of the designs and sort of selling them. So, another audience question then, this one's best directed to you at the moment. Um, can you tell us about how long it takes to go from concept to actually on screen and created for the costumes? Months and months. You start out usually trying to adapt the comic and then each director has their own vision of what the movie should look like so um let's say the costumes that you just showed with philip you know i had a vision in my head that i thought the world and so did the production designer but as we worked more and more with james gunn who wanted it simplified simplified graphic just so graphic that eventually all the sort of mosaic work and sort of renaissance you know elaboration just sort of got went away for really simple graphic shapes because he wanted flash gordon and so but you have to go through the myriad of different ideas. And, you know, our job as a costume designer is when something isn't working for the director, it's our job to come up with something else. You just keep going at it. You don't get stuck in one world. So that's why someone like Philip ends up doing gazillions of drawings. And I keep coming up with more and more ideas. And then suddenly it all just clicks with the world that the director wants to do. So, I mean, I've had costumes that, you know, we're still designing it as we're shooting, <laughs> you know, because also the scripts keep changing and the stories keep changing. I mean, that's another, you know, you know, wrench that gets thrown into our process. You know, often you're shooting and they want to change a whole thing and you're like, oh, but we already sort of established this. So now how do I redesign that? So people don't know that it's, you know, been now has a complete different concept and the costume does something it was never supposed to do so that's where someone you know like philip comes in you know you know it's it's invaluable to have someone who's so facile who can get these ideas out to the director so quickly and to marvel i mean everybody's involved in these meetings with us so it is as rue said you know and and maya as it is so collaborative more than most films and, you know, with everyone being involved in so many different types of characters, Maya, so I'll throw this audience question to you. We never see what heroes or villains wear under their costumes. Do you have to design special undergarments that fit with all of the sleek lines? What do you put under there? Uh, we do have, I mean, uh, is the, we call it underpinnings. And what it is, it's exactly that. It goes, it has to, you can't just trust a singlet or something like that. It has to do something that, this is a, this is a movie that is an action movie. When it moves, they move, you might see something here. So you wanna make sure that it's part of the costume of the lean down and you see the back of the collar that can be another material, you know, surprise material. Everything that you design is from head to toe and from the inside out. And in, uh, there are scenes in where, you know, they write later and it's not scripted before. When you uh, design the costume, they say, you know what, we're gonna have the actor take off his cuirass on camera 
So <laughs> what is he want to wear underneath? So you have to make sure you're ready for that. Mm -hmm. It has to be super cool looking because then you're getting closer to his skin. So and that has to be more attractive instead of unattractive. You know, it has to be something really, really cool. Uh, so always design from the inside out, from, you know, everything, everything. Even the bottom of their shoes. I seen shoes made by Judiana that I was like, ah, oh, I want to do those. You know, it's like uh, they do, the bottom of the shoes in a way that it looks cool. So if they kick to the to the uh, to the towards the camera, you see something not normal. You can't have normal when you're working in a superhero movie. You have to have something that people's gonna say, "Wow, look at the bottom of that shoe!" <laughs> and then it is like a, it's like a, you have to keep the audience in awe all the time you know, with surprises of this thing. And this, so yeah, to answer your question, yes, we design everything, even the underpinnings. Yes. I mean, that's an amazing detail that you even designed the bottom of the shoe. I feel like, Judiana, you were talking about shoes and that's that's amazing that you have to do that. Yeah. And like, like Maya said, there are so many cool elements that go into the costume. So Judiana, this question's for you from the audience, specifically about Avengers Endgame. When the Avengers time travel, they're wearing a white CGI costume. How did you go about making the prototypes for those costumes for visual effects to use? Well, that is actually one of the few costumes that there is no prototype. There are a million sketches. Um, Here's how movie making works sometimes. We didn't know we were having time suits until halfway through shooting of the movie. It, it was just an idea that sort of came up that we needed it. And suddenly the design process happened. Multiple, you know, sitting with Marvel, with Ryan Minerding, in with Kevin Feige. How do we do this? And then there was no time or money to actually make anything, considering you had about eight actors and CGI characters who all had different bodies with different types. I like that would take me two years to make those suits. So in the end, you know, we, you know, it was really just based off the design, it was all CG. It's one of the few things that I've done for Marvel that really is all CG. There's like nothing, you know, we, we often give them fabric and texture that helps, but it is, like I said, those things were designed almost when we were finished shooting. So <laughs> that was, I, we rarely used mocap and that was one of the few times we used mocap. And mocap being motion capture for anyone. Motion capture suits, yes. And, you know, this next question, actually, Judiana ties right in with what you were just saying. Um, the question is, how has technology for the fabrication and construction of the super suits actually changed since the first movie? And, Judiana, your first Marvel movie was back in 2014. Is that right? Saying so, I mean, that's a long time in the world of technology. Um, well, actually, my first Marvel movie was X-Men three, <laughs> which really it has changed since then, you know, certain things work and certain new technology works and certain old tricks are work because they are just good. So sometimes you, you fuss around with a lot of new technology and you end up going back to something that, you know, is more successful, but we, we try and do all the, we try and, you know, not get bored and, and use the same things over and over again. But a lot of times, you know, I'll say for Winter Soldier, they insisted we were never having that silver arm. It was always gonna be mocap. Um, Legacy effects and I said, we need the arm just to make the costume. So we're gonna make an arm, made the arm. And the first day on the set, you know, the uh, visual effects came to me and said, oh my God, he has to wear that arm the entire time. We're never using mocap. How fast can you make more arms? Because in the end, the real thing, not only does it help visual effects, but it helps the actor. You know, if they're in mocap often, they're not relating to the costume, you know, and what the function is. So we try and make as many costumes, like even Baby Groot, Baby Groot, there are two little Baby Groots made to scale with little costumes on them, and those were used for visual effects. So like I said, rarely do we do a full mocap, 
Spider-Man is one that we, you know, the high tech suit is full mocap, but rarely did we do it. I mean, it's amazing that like all the detail that goes into all of that, that, right. It's not just all like visual effects. We'll pop it in later, how much work you really have to do. So Philip, what are some of the methods? This is an audience question as well that you use to come up with concepts after the designer has given you their vision for the character. Um, I think that, uh, I try to, I'm very research based, I think, um, especially just from my background of working with costume designers for so long. So the key thing for me is grounding myself in not only who the character is, but like the why, like, why would they do this or why would they wear this? And so once I've given, been given kind of the go ahead with it, at least in terms of knowing like where I'm going, then it's about trying to ground, it's trying about looking about, I guess, the history of where, what these people are and who they are and where they're going and then trying to make good choices. I think that that's kind of, are, you know, competent, good choices. Um, and I think that that's something that I've just picked up along the way from working with so many designers is that I often feel like you can't just put something there. It has to make sense. Um, and so it's a constant balance. I think as a concept artist, it's hard because it's a constant balance between trying to illustrate something that's really cool looking, like that, you know, people will be like, that's cool. Like the nerd side, like awesome. And then also it still has to make sense. I think that's, that's, so it's like, I think I'm constantly going through that. And I find that when I get stuck um, or when I feel like I'm starting to get into a, a place where I'm having trouble, it's because I've either stopped learning or I've stopped paying attention to that, that, that pipeline or that through line, which is why. So it's like, then, then it's like, then I'm just kind of like spinning or like, I have to go ask questions or I have to say, Ruth, what does this mean? Or I have to say, you know, like I'm kind of stuck. I think that there's, there's those aspects of it too. But I think past that point in order to keep moving, I constantly have to either keep learning or to keep, um, asking myself that same question over and over again. Because right, truly the costumes are telling the story of the movie or helping further that story. So let's wrap up then with this final audience question. We'll direct it to all of you one at a time. Um, which costume resonated the most for you within the Marvel Universe? So Ruth, let's kick it off with you. Uh, I would say uh, the Dora Milaje costume resonated because we wanted to make this a serious uniform and we didn't want it to just be something that looked attractive. We wanted it to be functional. We put their their feet planted on the ground, uh, split toe boots. We had very specific um, ideas about, you know, how we wanted to present the women in Black Panther, especially those of the Dora Milaje who protect the, protected the king. Uh, we wanted them to be considered, you know, a, a, an army. And so they definitely needed to have a uniform, but it was, uh, you know, adjusted in ways that were on, was honoring the female form. So they could be beautiful and they could be powerful. And so that resonated the most for me. Uh, Judiana, what about for you? I think it would have to be the Captain America stealth suit in Winter Soldier. Um, that was where we created the modern Captain America. And every suit for every movie he's been in after, including the ones Alex built, are all based on that suit, how it's constructed, the center design. And um, it led up to getting to the scale suit. but. Once we established that, I think it, it changed who Captain America was and led the way through seven other movies <laughs> doing, you know, different versions of that same suit is pretty exciting to keep exploring the same costume. Maya, what about for you? For me, did I have to say it was a uh, Hela costume that I'm very proud of because uh, that costume, uh, started from a simple, you know, uh, reference from Jack Kirby. Again, most of uh, my design is being based on, on this fantastic artist. And um, as the actor, Kate Blanchett came along, he says, are you just making one type of costume? And I said, well, yeah, that's that was the idea. I mean, it's like, uh, there you are, you convert into Hela, and then, uh, and then that's it. He said, no. I, you know, I, my costume is part of my emotions. So 
I want to portray those emotions throughout also the costume. Sometimes uh, it should be black or it should, it should be like in tatters or it should be more pristine and then I have a cape. And the costume is part of the mood that she's in the moment. And it showed, so I was able to sketch a lot of uh, those versions with uh, Jonai Bacallado, my senior illustrator from a long time. And he, we did it uh, in a way that every costume will accommodate different scenes. And within this scene, it will evolve again. So you see many, this is, uh, this is when, uh, when the costume becomes a direct interaction with the performance of the actor and the script. So that was, that made me very proud. I'm very happy about that costume. And also the um, the head pieces were, I mean, the whole costume was executed by uh, Iron Head Studios, who I love and endorse a lot. And um, yeah, they did great. Uh, they, we did um, three different uh, head pieces that she only wore the big, you know, antlers, we call it antlers, um, just for for uh, pictures because it was difficult. I mean, you can't really block a scene without kind of like different, you can't block light, you can't turn. So even if we made it, she never wore it. She wore a cap and that was a motion um, CGI later because, uh, because it moved. You know, like it went up and down and uh, more mad and less. And it was that, that was the interaction I was telling you about. So I'm very happy about that costume. And it's amazing. And before we go to Phil for which costume resonated the most for you, I actually have some great news for everyone watching. And it's that I just got a message. The nice thing about not being in a room somewhere is that we can keep going. There's no one else who needs to come in after us. So uh, designers, don't you get up and walk away quite yet. We have so many audience questions and I've got some more for you too. So we can actually keep going for a little bit longer, which I know everyone in the chat is super excited about. So Phil, which costume resonated for you? Um, I have to say it's hard because there's so, there's so many, especially, you know, being a part of the universe for so long. Um, I will pinpoint the costumes in general of Black Panther because it was a kind of full circle moment for me. Um, being in the costume department with Ruth on Black Panther, um, especially since I'm so prone to research, um, historically, I think just as growing up, I think I always felt very disjointed from Africa um, in terms of like, you see it, you see it on TV, you see the way it's represented, all of those things. And without getting into them, it's just not represented in its full glory, right? So I think that with working with Ruth and having all this stuff, she had all this research from from um, from the film Roots that she had done. She had been there. Um, she had all of this different stuff that was going on. So it was the first time that I felt connected to Africa in a way to where I wasn't just seeing it visually or being like, those people's face painting is cool. Like now I can tell you who they are. Like I can say that's the Himba tribe and that braid means this and this means that. And I think that that was a really great learning experience. And so Ruth would come in and she'd say, these beads are this color because of this, because this person's married or because of this or the shapes of this. So I think that when I think back on it, I think that that experience for me I actually walked away from it with knowledge that I was able to retain um, about something that I was very interested in. And then I just continued to keep going after that. So I can't pinpoint, there were so many different experiences, especially working with even the costume designers here, just going along where I was learning. Um, but I feel like that's a moment that kind of stuck out for me as it felt like I actually, I didn't feel like I was just kind of putting on Africa as a garment. It felt like I actually understood it. And I think that that's something that I uh, was really appreciative of, um, especially in my Marvel history. That's beautiful. And I guess speaking of putting on garments, I know we um, had a chance to talk about some of the different ways you've created some of the costumes. And Juliana, we mentioned sort of Fat Thor really briefly. You had to do a couple of special things for that costume too, didn't you, to really help him embody the new character and the new body weight? Well, yes, when we, um, when we did Fat Thor, um, it was actually Chris who, it was very interesting because when he's Thor, 
he's always like, oh, this is too hot. Can you make it lighter? Can you make it easier to wear? Can you do this and this? But when he had on the fat suit, which by the way, was heavy and not so comfortable, he loved it. He never complained. He would, he just loved being that character and having so much fun. But we made weights for his wrists and for his ankles so that he would walk like a heavier person, not just, you know, he would move his hands and feet and they were heavy. They were not just a little ankle weight. We ended up trying to buy athletic weights and use it and it wasn't heavy enough. So we had to custom make these ankle weights and things to make it really look like he was shuffling or his arms were harder to pick up because he didn't work out anymore. Um, he was very committed to it. He had so much fun. He would literally wear almost anything. I mean, there were times when we would just put things on him because it was funny. And I go, you really can't wear this onesie in the movie, but will you put it on just to entertain me? And he's like, I want to put it on. I'll put it on. And he'd walk around in it. But, you know, at, at a certain point, you have to pull back. So you watch the movie that I mean, that's part of the thing, thing working with the Russo brothers. Like I said before, it's almost having the costumes not noticed. It's it's pulling back to where they're more real than some of the other films, um, which is, you know, not easy for costume designers to do. But they want a certain reality, more like their political thrillers. Doing something like The Avengers, where you're combining every movie that Marvel has ever made into one, you have to make subtle changes to everybody else's costumes to have it all fit in the same movie. Um, but I have to say, Chris Hemsworth, it was, those fittings were probably some of the most fun I've ever had on a movie. He just went for it. <laughs> and you mentioned that you even had to find and add more weights. Do you remember how much weight he was carrying? I, I don't, we just kept adding more and more and making these, you know, ankles, you know, for his ankles and for his wrists. <laughs> You know, he had to be, he's pretty strong, but he had to be really strong to wear those things. And for days, I mean, he, most of the movie, he's fat Thor. And we really thought in the beginning, he wouldn't be fat Thor for that long a time. And everyone was like, no, he's going to stay fat Thor for the whole thing. <laughs> so <laughs> there you go. And how the costumes fit obviously can make such a huge difference, not just for the actors when they're doing their thing, but for the stunts. And Ruth, you had an experience on Black Panther, right, where you had to really work on one of the costumes to smooth it out. There was a bit of an accident with a stunt person, wasn't there? Oh, Ruth, you're oh. muted, so you just need to unmute oh, yourself. Oh, sorry. Yes, yes. Uh, you know, there are those things, too. Um, and you just have to be open. We, we, we wanted to create something that, you know, was very special for the Panther suit. I mean, Adi Gradov did a wonderful job designing it. And I did, did a lot of research on other superhero suits and thought, you know, what is the one thing that I can do here that would, you know, make a mark and connect the T'Challa to, you you know, Africa, not just have him as this separate, you know, Black Panther walking around because he's the king. And so we decided that uh, if we did a thin skin on top of the muscles, uh, that the vibranium uh, silver muscle suit would kind of emanate through the the thinner fabric on top. And then we we layered that with a triangle. We called the Okavango triangle and we gave it a meaning. We were so proud of this suit and it went to set and T'Challa looked amazing and you could see the vibranium just emanating from below and uh, the stunt guy uh, joined him and did a stunt and blew his pants. Oh. So we thought this fabric is way too thin. So we had to on the fly kind of, you know, patch him back together and, you know, yeah, everybody's together. It's embarrassing, but, you know, they know that you're going to come up with some kind of a solution, which we did. Um, mm -hmm. We did a tougher suit. Uh, we brought in someone from the Boston Ballet to uh, uh, put it together. And she knew the gussets and all the different curves to put under the arms and stuff. So the stunt guy could actually do all of that work. And uh, it didn't really matter about all the details on the suit because he was moving so fast, you couldn't see them anyway. So we just did a basic suit of the, in a heavier weight. But it was a lesson, you know, it was a lesson for me that sometimes, you know, function 
does uh, pre uh, precipitate uh, what we do as a designer because they have to be able to perform and several types of performances are involved. And the other thing that's really interesting with costumes and performing, right, is you're not just seeing something from the front. You really have to design something that works 360 degrees because they could be doing anything at any time, basically. I don't so know anyone at, who just designs from the front. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I'm saying. You know, like, you know, it's like you think of us now on screen, right? We're only seeing one side. Like, who knows what's behind us? <laughs> How about that? <laughs> Well, Philip will know that one thing our illustrators always hate is like, okay, now you have to do the back view. Yeah. Always. <laughs> we're always moving so fast. And, and then, and like, yeah. oh, no. <laughs> it always ends up being that way. Uh, we'll draw the front and then it'll be like, what about the back? And you're like, oh, yeah. And then, like, then there's also the, uh, um, we'll get the uh, seamstresses or the, you know, the cutter fitters, they'll run into the room and they'll be like, what? is back here, like, like what's back here? So we're constantly having to do it and like moving super fast. It's always fun. <laughs> so when you are thinking of the back of a costume and working on the illustration fill, then like what types of things do you need to make sure to put back there? Like, is there a zipper in these super suits to get them on? There's always a, yeah, there's always the talk of how do they get into the suit and where that, you know, where those seam lines are going to be or where there's going to be a lack of seams because they want to try something different. Um, and there's all these little tricks that the costume designers will do to try to hide those things. Um, I've seen some really creative ones um, between all of the ladies here on how to hide different seam lines to make it to where you're not just like, not everybody's suit is zipping up the back or it looks like, you know, they're running into action and they're like, wait, I gotta get into this weird, and, you know, like they, there's a lot of tricks there. Um, and so it's a constant thought, even when we're doing our seam lines and our style lines and stuff like that, to think about how they're gonna get into it. Um, and, um, and then also trying to figure out, you know, sometimes it's just like, again, that function side, like where the zipper is going to be, how are they going to be hidden, you know? Um, and that's like, that's just a constant across the board. Um, just trying to hide little details. Um, um, it's definitely something that we think about. And then now moving into the future, we're using a lot of 3d as well. So I think that the, the front and the back is no longer something where it's flat. Like you kind of you're forced by proximity when you're going around the body. You have to do it all at the same time. And so, I mean, like when you're doing that, you told us there are lots of places that you can hide things. So we need we need an answer. Like, where do you hide zippers? <laughs> uh, I think that there's 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 I've seen some really creative ones. Like I know in the Spider-Man suit, depending on where his, his zippers end up landing, there's some stuff where it kind of goes down in the bottom of his shoe or something like along the line, the seam lines, because they're constantly trying to make sure all of those lines line up. And as a costume designer, that's often really tricky because it's like, it's a puzzle. I think the whole costume feels like a jigsaw puzzle often. And they're constantly working through this process of trying to figure it out. Um, so for me, I like, I think in a certain instance, I have to think about it, but I luckily don't have that problem. <laughs> so I have to think about it only so far. And then there's a whole process that it goes down the line and try and figure out how to actually do that. that that's when the crazy crafts people who make these clothes come up with the solutions. Yeah. How do, I mean, I will tell you our Thor costume, he has a zipper up the front. No one knows there's a zipper. It's a hidden. He insisted that he needed to be able to get in and out of it without three people helping him to get out of his clothes. And we figured out a way that he could get out of his Thor costume by himself. He needed help getting back in it. But there is actually a hidden zipper right up that front that no one will. Yeah, it's pretty. And that was my clever wardrobe people. When, when Chris told me that on the phone, I want a zipper up the front. I went, well, that's not going to happen. You're in armor. And then I, instead of saying that, I was like, okay, well, let me think about that for a minute, thinking that'll never happen. And then I went to my genius crew, uh, Marilyn Matson and Dorothy Bulak, who said, we can figure that out we'll find a way to do that for him that he can actually get out of it by himself in between shots. Because these clothes are very, you know, just going to the restroom, it, it can be an ordeal, you know? These are not easy clothes to wear. So part of our job is to, 
you know, work with the craftsmen and in our designs, figure out a way to make the actor more comfortable. One of, I'll say too, one of the coolest ones that I saw, and I'm not going to say where it is, is I, I, I challenge all of you fans to try to find where Captain Marvel zippers, zippers are. Well, I know I because I did the first Captain Marvel suit. Since I, I did the first suit, the, I know exactly where they are. And that's the thing. I saw those and I challenge you just continue to watch the films and try to figure out if you can figure out where they are. They're very well hidden. Well, I think on most of these costumes, even when, you know, I first came in and looked through Alex's clothes, Alex Burns' clothes, you know, it's like, where are the zippers? How do they get in and out? What are the, how do, you know, and it's really complicated. You know, they're really, it's, it's these people who make them are geniuses. Seriously. Well, so now we've heard that Chris had some costume requests with the zipper. And as you said, Tom did, and he came with lots of plans and ideas. Ruth, did you have any actors? I guess you can be as vague as you want to, but <laughs> did you have actors who had like a very specific request that you had to try and work into your costume design? Well, I think it's the footwear, the footwear that's inside the panther suit. You know, each uh, each stunt uh, person had a special, specific type of shoe that they wanted to wear. And so we were building the actual panther foot and his design of the, of the foot around a different shoe for each person who had to wear it. So there was a boxing boot, there was an all-terrain type of a shoe. There were all of these different shoes that, that the one panther had to wear. So that was a little bit of a challenge, but for the most part, I think it was pretty, pretty seamless. No pun intended, right? <laughs> now I'll, I'll go back to some audience questions because I know everyone's eager. One of the audience questions that has actually come up a couple times now is how do you actually work with your costumes and the comic book source material to actually do still something that is unique and organic for the movie you're creating while staying true to the source material? So, Judiana? <laughs> Well, it depends on the character and it depends on the director. You know, often, I, I will say my first interview with the Russo brothers before I was hired on the Winter Soldier, I looked at the Falcon and I printed out some images from the comic going, oh my God, I hope I don't have to make this. And I go in and the first thing they say is, we want this more reality based. And um, so I pulled out the pictures of the Falcon. I said, so I don't have to do this from the comic? And they went, no, <laughs> it doesn't work for this film. We need more real based, you know, more military combat. So, I mean, it, it really just depends. I mean, other things are comic accurate and it, it just depends the vision of the director and what the script requires but we always try and give a feeling you know if we can from the original comic and so the, a lot of the suits also come like you work with sort of co co-collaborators right, and co-creators for some of the the costumes so can you sort of give a shout out to some of those um collaborators and co-creators uh we'll just go around i guess maya's um, you mean from uh, from my own crew or collaborators from uh, from other specialty houses? You mean? You know, that's the question that that I received for you. So you know what? Why don't we give it a second? Then we'll we'll wait for some uh, clarification on that, yeah. and uh, and we can sort of move forward. Another question that's come up for all of you is uh, talking about like working with the actors in their fittings. Sort of going back to that concept, and what else are you doing in the fittings exactly, other than you know, like you mentioned, Maya's talking about you know some costuming ideas. But what are some of the other things that that actors happen during that time? Well, often a costume will completely change in the fitting. Um, you know, we in Avengers, there was a concept about what Robert Downey's opening costume would do, and it never really worked. And he finally came to me and said, that's not what I want. I want you to design something completely different. Let's go talk to Kevin Feige, because I needed to do this, and I needed to do something else and and you know he works very closely with the script he knows that character and so after working for quite a while on a concept um it got completely changed after all these fittings into something 
that really worked better for the movie and the script. Because, you know, often, you know, we like sketches and, and they are a useful tool. But once you get in, in there, you know, it, the reality hits <laughs> and it doesn't work. And we have to be the first ones to recognize when it doesn't work and move on. Um, but in the end, that's how we came up with that sort of um, jogging suit uh, that Robert Downey wears. And also because the script kept changing, the opening of the movie completely changed after we had already started shooting. And it's like, oh, my God, now what do I do? Well, we build an underlayer that, you know, has all these um, hexagons and the hexagons light up and then they turn into the suit. And, you know, it was just it was so complicated just to get what that was because this the script was very organic at that point you know it just kept evolving mm -hmm. and um trying to accommodate that is uh you know that's part of that's most of our job but that's what happens in fittings and it's also when the actor really can't move or they're not comfortable you know it's our job to to rethink it they're in front of the camera and we're not mm -hmm. so that's our that's a, a lot of our job. It's a highly collaborative art form. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's no uh, beginning and end at any point. It's, it's always uh, ever changing and morphing. And it's, you know, I, I've seen some beautiful work come out of Marvel's VizDev and they do hundreds of illustrations and then they move on to the other projects and you're, it's there to inspire and it's and, and it's up to Marvel in this instance to decide what they want for their film and then you get it and it, it's 2D, it's a piece of paper, you have to kind of create it and they give you the space to create and that's the beauty of working with them that they give you the space to create and it allows you to use materials, use vendors from all over the world to collaborate with 3D artists, to go into a, a, a traditional sewing room and put something on a cutting table. They give you the, the ability to take what is 2D and, and create it into 3D and make it live on an actor, which is huge, a huge part of what we do. That, that, that collaboration is always there, it's ever present, um, but we ultimately have to make it work because the film will start, will, will start spinning, we will, we will begin to shoot this picture. And you can't, you know, just paint a costume in any kind of a brush and expect an actor to just put it on and walk to the set. They do have a say in how they feel in it, how it makes them feel. So we are the nucleus of that. And so to all of the collaborators that we uh, work with, we our hats are off because without them, we exactly. couldn't get our job done. And they do take things to another level and another plane that is not achievable by just one. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with that. I agree with that also. I mean, we all have, you know, the one thing that Marvel understands is how difficult it is to make one of these costumes. And they allow, in most instances, the time to develop a costume and work with VizDev. And, you know, I work with either Andy Park or with Ryan Myrnding, and they are brilliant. And, but again, they're doing a sketch. I invite them to the fittings often to see when things work, when they don't work, how we can change things, how we can manipulate. And um, it, it, it's the Viz Dev meetings are a remarkable thing. I mean, you have them every week and it includes the directors, me, my assistant, or, you know, any designer. And then the, um, you know, Ryan or whichever Viz Dev is working on the sketches that day, whichever um, concept artists from Marvel. And, you know, you, it, the ideas that get thrown around the table are remarkable. It, it's, it's, it's incredible. You even have, you know, Vittorio Alonso and you have, you know, Lou, Lou come in, Esposito, and everybody's in there so that everybody knows what the movie needs. And when something isn't working, everybody has the freedom to speak up and say, that is a beautiful sketch, 
but I, you know, I think in order to make it work, we need to do this. Or what about going in a whole nother direction? And everybody, nobody is cowed by the process. Everybody is very involved in the process. And I haven't had that on many other movies, I have to say. And it's really, it, it's delightful. It, it's, and, and again, the collaboration with the other designers from other movies, that never happens in any other world where I get to collaborate with Ruth or with Maya's. That's, you know, and then with our illustrators, you know, you have the Marvel illustrators and then we all have our own team of illustrators. And somehow we, as head of the department, have to pull it all together and make a movie and make it all look like one film and coordinate it all. But it is a remarkable thing how Marvel works and the collaborative, collaborative process is very different than other films. And it's really enjoyable. I want to say too, I think I want to give a shout out just that um, we've been talking about visual development. One of the key things that has been different about having them or having Marvel in the way that they specifically work is just when you look back at even the history of costume in, um, in uh, superhero, right? Is Marvel has done a really good job of making sure like they know their characters, but they also at the key core root of it, they want to ensure that when you show up to the movie, and you see Captain America, Captain America looks like Captain America. You know, yeah. Thor looks like Thor, T'Challa looks like T'Challa. There's not any decisions being made to where you can look outside of it. So I think that with starting with BizDev and the comic reference and everything else and kind of expanding out from there, um, historically, Marvel, to me, has been one of the first to actually be able to keep a full unified world all together to where you're not only getting all of the costumes across the different films are linking together in such a beautiful way, but you're also getting a full cinematic universe to where if you read the comics, you can theoretically go to this film and you could be like, you can pick out the character right away without guessing or them, them being so changed that you can't figure out who they are. Um, so that's been kind of a key pipeline in that too, is kind of it creates this like base, especially with Kevin, because he's so on it. Um, and making sure that they, they, also look give each, they also give each director the freedom to have their own vision. Correct. It does not have the Russo's vision is very different than Taika's vision, you know, and or James Gunn's vision, you know, or the world of Black Panther. You know, when we actually there's a little bit of Wakanda at the end of Civil War. And we very consciously had meetings to not establish the world and let the movie, we knew the Black Panther movie was coming, let those designers and that director create their own world. We were very careful to be almost generic about it. So we didn't make a big statement and you didn't notice. And it's because Kevin knows that all these movies are gonna be interconnected at some point, but he's very, it's wonderful that each group of directors has the freedom to get their vision across for that film. Yeah. And I think that's why it was so hard to get the Avengers to all be a unified movie, the last two. But I think that that's a remarkable thing that even though you, it is a comic world and they have a style, each one is so different. Each film is completely different tone. And that's what makes a world, a universe, exactly. uh, yeah. all these elements. Mm -hmm. I've been, I've been, uh, Lucky to work with Andy Park and his team. I never worked with Ryan, but I heard also wonderful things. So, and as Philip said, uh, it starts there and then it develops into us and together mm -hmm. and we form something that actually works for the project and that exactly. makes it wonderful. Mm -hmm. Very well said, Juliana. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it is amazing what all of you do and the houses, the outside houses that you collaborate with. Is there one in particular then that typically works on the Marvel costumes to help with that collaboration and design process for the superheroes? Judiana. Well, I think, well, I think we all have people we, I've used every, every specialty house there is. I have a particularly strong relationship with legacy effects. And I try and do as much as I possibly can with legacy, but often, and I will say, I try and build most of costumes in-house. We set up our own shop. Once in a while, we have to send something out to Jose at Ironhead or to Russ, you know, you know, there's all these different houses and the films are so large, you have to farm a few things out. As much as I can set up my own shop and bring these 
technicians in because um, I'm sure Maya's and Ruth, we are all control freaks and we want it right there so we can see every step that's being taken. But I'm sure everyone has a different relationship with different, um, you know, different people. I just happen to work particularly well with legacy. But like I said, I enjoy working with everyone. They all bring something different to the table. You know, so certain kind of costumes I might not take to Legacy, I might take somewhere else. Just depends. You know, and uh, Wet also is really good. I mean, Legacy. I have not had the opportunity to work with Weta one of these days. Yeah. Well, you know, speaking of also with, you know, everyone coming together to collaborate on the costumes, all of you have come together so wonderfully today. And thank you so much for this amazing panel. I know the audience has really loved it too. Unfortunately, we're definitely officially out of time now, but the good thing is for anyone who's watching, you can come back to this link as early as later today and watch again. So if you want some ideas for cosplay costumes, some tips, if you just want to watch because you missed a part and we're so excited about it, come on back to this link. So thank you again to everyone on the panel, to the Costume Designers Guild, partner Joanne Fabric and Craft Stores, platinum sponsor ABC Studios Costumes for this fantastic panel. Thank you also to Ingle Dodd Media for setting this up and of course to the panelists. So thank you for watching. I hope everyone has a wonderful weekend ahead. Bye-bye. Thank you, friends. Thank you, guys. Bye.